So Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews, but are not. But they are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, which he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Okay, so I just have a quick PowerPoint to, to just give some just brief information on the Church of Smyrna before we discuss. So facts, just some quick background facts for the church. Number one, it was an ancient city of Iona. So it's on the Western coast of Asia Minor. So actually I don't have a map next time. Maybe I'll have a map prepared. So it's, it's on the West side facing Greece. If you can imagine the present day Turkey and the Mediterranean. So it's on the West. Um, closer towards obviously Western Europe, if you can imagine that. And it's about 40 miles north of Ephesus. So it's, it's rather close to Ephesus, okay? Um, it also has a mixed population of 200,000 people approximately. So it's, it's, it's a pretty big city. It's not small by any means. And about one third profess to be Christian. So that would, pro that would probably be at the climax of the growth of the church in the church in Smyrna. But the church historically has this um, has this history of persecution. So Polycarp is the is the pupil of Apostle John. He's a prominent leader in the church, and Polycarp is martyred in AD one one five five. So this is extra biblical information. Polycarp is a church father, but it is helpful because we also see more. It helps set up the context for the for the for the church's situation because we, all, we also see um, this the, in some ways we can mirror read the church's historical context based upon what the letter to the church of, of Smyrna says. So at this time, let's go back to the text and let's, let's work through it and we can discuss. Let me go ahead and share one more time. So here we have the text before us. So let's look, let's look at, there's only three, there's only, I think, four verses, so it's easy for us this time. It's not a big passage. Let's look at, number one, repetitive ideas and concepts from the previous weeks, uh, from the previous context. Number two, let's look at who the actor is, what, uh, what is the object, what are the commands, what are, what are relationships, what's going on here, what are statements, what are, what are types of statements being stated so what are your observations looking let's focus first on 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 verses eight what do you notice here what sticks out to you it's, it's, it ahead. is uh to the church okay so it's so it's it's um written to let's just add here atimari test it's it's not just the church but it's the all right so so Ati Mari Tessa's observation was that uh, the object is the angel, or we talked about this being the messenger to, uh, to the church in Smyrna. So the letter is being addressed to the church of Smyrna. And what other observations do you have? What else do you have? Another reference to the first and the last. Yeah, so what specifically, though? Well, the words are from the, the yeah. one who's the first. Okay. So the, 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 writing, the writing is the word. So this is also part of the object. If you could imagine, the words are to go to the angel. So grammatically speaking, if you're looking at grammar, this would be probably like 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 the the the, um, the direct object. That's what's being written. What's being written are the words. And then 
and then this would be an indirect object. This is the the receive. This is the the receiver of the message. Is everyone tracking there with me? And the specifically, this is the command. Oops. This is a command to write. Okay. And then Sylvia made that observation that the the words are the words of the first and the last. Okay. Who, who, did you mention Sylvia who that is specifically? Jesus. Yeah, so it's uh, the risen, exalted Lord. And what what specifically did we talk about? What is what is the first and, from previous weeks? What does the first and last signify? What is the significance of this for this first and last? Beginning and the end. Okay, so yeah, you have a beginning. So there's a there's a beginning and an end. It's it's the it's like the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? So so what is the what is the theological significance is what I'm trying to get at. What's the theological significance? Life and death. Well, from that that could be a different, you know, we you know, that could be for for um yeah, so concerning us, that that would be the case. The beginning and the end of us would be life and death. But concerning what does the who else was called the first and the last is from our from our from our weeks prior I'm, I'm thinking about um with reference to, to to who who else was called the first and the last jesus god the father okay yeah so it's jesus is being called here the first and last he also was called in the previous context but what i'm trying to get at is the big significance is this is a reference to um god the father Okay. This is the um, Yahweh of the Old Testament. Okay. And so we talked about what does the first and the last signify? What does the first and last signify specifically about God? So God is called the first and the last in the Old Testament, but um, so this is more this is more the 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 name here. But, I, but I'm still looking for the significance. What is the significance? We mentioned this the before. Creator. Okay, yeah, so there could be this sense of, of, of creator. For sure, Yahweh is called the creator. But I'm still thinking about a different con idea that we... Um, uh, do, correct, is this not a reference? Is this not a reference to time? This is a reference to time. So this is speaking towards the eternality, the eternality of God. He, he has no beginning. He has no end. It's, he's, he's the whole, he's forever. Okay. The, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. These two polar opposites are sig signifying the eternality of God. Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to, I'm, maybe I'm trying to to belabor the point here is that this 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 statement is meant to be an encouragement to the church in some way. Co correct. It, it, from last week, what was the statement from last week, and how is it a, a, an encouragement or a warning from last week? Does anyone want to share what what the last week's description of the risen exalted lord was and how did that help the church what was the question again tim please okay so the question was um i, I I'm, I'm drawing a parallel the the way that jesus is going to describe himself is going to be a benefit or a warning for the church okay um so i'm just reviewing at this place my question is how did jesus describe himself in the previous letter and how did that how did we had that discussion I'm, i guess it's review how did that impact 
the, the content of what was written to the church, how are they to respond? Does anyone remember how Jesus was described last week to the church of Ephesus? And how did that impact the, the church? What was the impact? To repent. Okay, so that was the command. But I'm saying specifically right now, uh, um, Frank and, and others, is how did Jesus describe himself last week? Just to get really... How did he, so here he's describing himself as the first and the last. How did he describe himself last week? Uh, he holds the seven star, uh, the seven lamps. Yeah, he holds the seven he stars. Holds the seven stars. And, and he, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Are, are you referring he to the, in the midst of the seven okay. Hold on, lamps, there's, lamps. there's two people talking. There's, there's two people talking. So let Frank finish and then, then, um, and then, uh, Kuya, Kuya Raul can say something. So, so, Frank, your comment was, can you just repeat it? Yeah, that he, he holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden lamps. Yes, and does, do you remember what do you remember what that signified? We had a significance there. Does anyone remember that? Maybe Frank. Ra Raul, go ahead. Were, were you referring to the word all-knowing? That he was all knowing. In, in okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, that's good. No, that's that's so that's part of the package. So, that's a great observation, Raul. That's part of the package. I'm thinking about that one. So, no, so all, all knowing is part of it, Kui Raul. All knowing is part of it. What's, what's that bigger concept? So, let's first identify what did, what did holding the seven stars in the right hand signify? Does anyone remember what we said it signified? The angels. Okay, yeah. So, but yeah, that's true. He's holding the seven angels. But what did that? I'll just come back here. Uh, Dibar, Dibar, remember up here, we talked about how the, the, the idea of holding is this idea of control or sovereignty, and the walking is this idea of presence. And so we talked about how the big picture here, which includes what Raul is saying, Kui Raul, about the all-knowing, is that Jesus here is pictured as the judge uh, assessing, inspecting, and, and warning that he's going to, if they don't, if they don't repent, what, 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 what Frank said, he's going to judge them. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at, maybe, it was, maybe I was really confusing. I apologize for that. I wasn't clear. What I'm trying to get at is that in this context, the... The description of the words of the risen, exalted Christ is, is meant to be a warning to them, reminding them that they are, that he is the judge. He is the one that's in control, and he is the one that's present assessing them, okay? So what I'm trying to get at is here, as we look at this text, um, the first and the last, the fact that he is um, uh, eternal, the eternal God, is this going to be, how is this going to, to help or, or warn the church is what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to help us to see that Jesus is not just randomly giving descriptions of who he is, but the specific descriptions are designed to either encourage or to warn, okay? Is everyone tracking there with me? And that's coming back from to the to the big vision in chapter one of the risen exalted Lord. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that maybe it will be positive. Let's see. But um, the vision of, 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 of Jesus Christ, the Lord, is a multifaceted, a complex vision. It's not all encouragement. It's not all death and gloom and destruction. There is this. There is this incredible multifaceted vision of who Christ is in his fullness. And it's meant to be both an encouragement and a warning to us. Is everyone tracking there where I'm kind of, I was kind of confusing. I apologize for that. Uh, I wasn't super clear. So the first thing we have here is this eternality. So just be thinking, how is that going to encourage or maybe warn the church? We, 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 haven't, we haven't seen that yet. Maybe, maybe you will see it. The, the other description, the other description is what in, 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 in verse eight? He died and came to life. Yeah, so great. So 
Number one, the exalted risen Christ. He is the eternal God. So we could say here, what is this signifying? He's the eternal, he's the, he's the eternal Lord, God. And then number two, uh, he is the crucified, risen Christ. Okay? So think about, think about that. Think about the crucifixion. Death refers to sacrifice of sins. Correct? Overcoming death. This signifies um, undoing the curse of Adam. Does everyone see that? So we have here the words of the eternal Lord God. So this is not an angel. This is not, a, a, you know, this is not someone who, who heard something. This is not merely a man. This is the eternal, these are the words of the eternal Lord God. So it's, so in, 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 you could also in, in have the idea of everything in, included there. Frank mentioned creator, yes. All, all powerful, yes. All knowing, yes. Uh, literally, Yahweh himself. So these are the words of Yahweh, the eternal Lord God himself. And the one who died, sacrificed for our sins, uh, took our sins upon him, gave us his righteousness, and overcame death. The overcoming of death, the resurrection, signifies that, that the Lord God's judgment penalty uh, was sufficient. He accepted it. Do you see what I'm saying there? So it's, it's uh, you could also in some ways think about this being, if we're going to get really basic, if we're going to, these are significances, and maybe it's very pregnant full of terminology, but you could say here, the words of, you could say the words of God and also man and it's and it's the the christ the anointed one so it's it's the god man it's the god man okay everyone tracking there with me any questions or is anyone is this making sense any questions or comments please just ask a quick question yeah just wonder, wondering why in in, the, in your translation when it says first and the last, it has the F and the L as small letters, but in the NIV translation, it has it as capital F and capital L. Is there is there a reason why one says capital and one says lowercase? Yeah. yeah so what what that's what, what, what that's what that's what's wrong with the ESB. What what version do you have? What version do you have? The, the, the NIV has first and last capitalized the first letter, whereas. I was just wondering why that's the case, if it, if it matters. I mean. Yeah, so so to be honest with you, it's probably just a translation decision. Perhaps the NIV, any reference to Jesus or to God, they're going to capitalize. And ESV probably doesn't have that nomenclature. To kind of, I'm going to give a jab back at Pastor. Um, the, the first time this was written in Greek, it's all capital. They would write in all caps. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but but if if I was the one writing, maybe I would have capitalized it. So so there there you go. You know maybe I would go with the NIV. <laughs> there is no theological significance on the capitals or not. Yes, of course. If it's God, they always capitalize the letter. But it's the same thing. Whether may, may it be uh, lower or upper case is the same uh, reference yeah. to, to Jesus Christ. Yeah. No, that's just that you know the Jehovah's Witnesses they would actually have small letter you know because they don't see Jesus yeah. as, as 
deity, so they would have it small. So that's why I'm asking why here it's consistent with the Jehovah's Witness Bible, you know. So well, I would say I would say it's consistent with so there was a period of time in academia, Silvio, maybe a hundred years ago plus, even in writing styles where any reference to God, the grammar was to capitalize. Jesus capitalized. This is like across all uh, writing, okay? And then in like 19th, 20th century with the with uh, 21st century with the rejection of with the rejection of you know uh, you know the, you know the, the emphasis of naturalism you know rationalism um, they just were like no we're not going to do that because it's just it's just your opinion so they like they they went the opposite direction so that's kind of that's probably more so why ESV is doing that here it's just it's not a direct reference to Jesus. It's just a description. Um, because does, does your Bible have who died and came to life? Is that capitalized or no? And that's not caps. And in, in, in yeah, United. so, so, yeah, so, it, yeah, I, no doubt it's a, no doubt it's a point for the, for the Jehovah's Witness. Um, you know, that's what they would say, but it's more along that line. Great question. Okay, let's, let's go on. We're, 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 we need to move on to the next section. Great question, though. Um, so this is the introduction, and then now we're looking at the content. What does Jesus say to this church? What does Jesus say to this church? What is a repetitive word from the previous context that, that we can see here? What's a repetitive word? I here? know. I know. You got know. it. Frank. Frank's on top of things. So this is a knowing. This is a knowing. This is the... Again, this is the actor. And so that we can say, this is a knowledge statement here. And so what is it that he knows? What is it that he, he knows? knows? Go ahead. Maritas. He knows everything about you. Okay, yes, that's true, but specifically here in the context, what does he know? About your works, what do you do, your tribulation, your happiness, if you are poor, whatever you are into that position or whatever you are, he knows. Yeah, so, but, so, so specifically in this context, specifically in this context, concerning the church of Smyrna, okay? He knows about number one, what Ati said. Uh, not yet their works, right? It's 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 the tribulation. It's their it's their suffering, right? He also knows about number two, their their poverty. So this is physical poverty. But look what he says. You're physically poor, but you are rich. So if you're physically poor, but really rich, this is speaking to a, a spiritual richness. A spiritual richness and an eternal richness. They might be poor in this age, in this world, but in the world to come, they are rich. Okay, notice here, notice here, there's no mention of all the works that the Ephesus church had. The, Eph the Ephesus church had outward works, but they lost their first love, right? They, their inward was not so good, correct? Here, there's no reference to outward works. The only thing outward is their physical tribulation and their physical poverty, right? But 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 this speaks to their true spiritual condition. Okay? So just hold it there for a minute, okay? So they're outwardly they're poor, outwardly they're suffering persecution. Uh, what else outwardly are they suffering? What's the what else are they, what, what is something else that they're experiencing? 
they're being slandered by yeah people by by what by by what people by who they say they are Jews but they're not that's a strong statement right because listen this is not the words of John the Apostle. This is not the words of Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul will call th those that are outwardly circumcised, they will say of the mutilation. <laughs> Philippians 3, it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're mutilating the flesh. They're, they're not the real circumcision. You are the real circumcision. Okay, so it's like, okay, fine, Paul. You know, people will say, okay, whatever, Paul. You know, you're talking strong. Um, but look, look at this. Th they're being slandered by those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So this is one description. They claim to be Jews. But in reality, they are, they are of the religion of Satan. So, yeah, is that like saying that they're Christian, but they're not? No, so so what it's, it's it's like they're claiming so so to be specific, these are most likely because of the reference to let me just highlight here the reference to this, the reference to this, uh, not uh, just this here, okay? These are. Uh, Jewish people physically. So these would be Jews. These would be Jews. But what Jesus is saying is they claim to be Jews, but they are not. Rather, they're of the synagogue, not of, of my father, but of Satan. That is an incredibly strong statement coming from Jesus himself. I mean, that's insanely strong. Does everyone understand that, what's going on here? These are people that, that would be physically born to Abraham. They have the Jewish lineage. They, they are physically Jews, but they do not trust in the Messiah. And, and it's not as if, you know, oh, they, they still are in the people of God. It's no, they're actually a part of Satan. They're a part of the dominion of Satan. They're part of Satan's religion. And this is not John's words. This is the words of the exalted, risen Lord. That's insane oh, yeah, and powerful. Have, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I have a question. So, so hold, okay, let, let, hold on. Let's, let's go first to Pastor Noel, then, then Raul, just so that we're, we're, we're Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, the, so meaning Jesus, Jesus now have a uh, a different definition of what a Jew, a Jewish person is there, right? He's talking about more spiritual than physical because you know, being becoming a Jew is you you're born, of course. Yeah. On 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 on, on an Israelite Jew, and now they, Jesus was saying they are not really Jews, but. This is now has a different definition of what it is to be a Jew, right? Am I, am yeah. I correct? Yeah. So, so what I, the only thing I want to tweak there is is that yes, Jesus for sure has a different definition. So you're 100 percent correct there. What I would I want to tweak is that this is how it's always been. Just because they were this was Paul's argument in Romans. This is uh, John the Baptist's warning in, in John three uh, in, in Matthew three. We'll go there. Is that it was never, Abraham's seed was never just, the seed was never God's people of, of, of a, a, a true person of God was never Abraham's seed merely by, uh, by physical posterity, but it was always in connection with belief and faith. And so that's why Jesus is, Jesus is just picking up on that. So let's, let's look at several passages, passages of scripture just to kind of show that it's not a new concept, because I hope everyone would agree, it, it's very strong, correct? It's very strong. Um, let's look at several passages of scripture just to confirm that, okay? Um, let's go to, let's go to John, John chapter, uh, Matthew chapter three. 
Matthew chapter 3. Uh, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, you know, he's the voice crying. So then, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you, <laughs> you children of Abraham. No, you offspring of vipers. <laughs> you offspring of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. So even here, the whole point is that you can't base your salvation. You can't base your your relationship with God merely upon physical origin. It must be spiritual. John 8. Okay, I'm sorry. There it is. John 8. Here we go. John, John, go in your Bibles to John 8, 40. John 8, 40. So verse 39, they answered him and said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did, which is faith. You would be having faith. And believing in the promise offspring. Um, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is what Abraham did. You are doing the, the works your father did. They said, we were not born in sexual immorality. We have one, we have one father, even God. Jesus said, if, if God were your father, you would love him. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And you will, your will is to do your father's desires. So that's, that's John the Baptist preaching pre-Messiah. This is Jesus' words. One more passage before we, we, before we go back to our study. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verse, verse 25, for circumcision, physical circumcision is indeed a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man is uncircumcised, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not the letter. So what I want us to see here is that what Jesus is saying is just repeating what is in Paul, what is in his own teachings before, what is actually in the Old Testament. Um, Scripture, we could go to multiple references where there's the command to have the circumcision of the heart. What I'm trying to get at is that what Pastor said is, is accurate. Uh, Jesus is, is defining that they are not actually Jews. The question is, um, are, were these slanderers part of the church of Smyrna? Um, no, so they would, have been, they would have been physical Jews, a part of the, of the local synagogue. But the church in Smyrna would have been composed of Jews and Gentiles, but because they're but because they are Christians and they're claiming to be uh, followers of Christ the Messiah, that that would have incited massive persecution from the local Jewish synagogue, because there's because they would be professing in the Messiah, they would be saying that they are part of the promises of, of the Lord. And, the, and it would just, they, the, the Jews would just be going nuts because they're like, no, you're not part of the old covenant. You know, this is a, this is a, this is a, um, this is a uh, malignant form of our religion. That's what they would be saying. And then they would be persecuted. So great, great question. And I think those, those slanderers are the, are the Pharisees and the, the, the scribes yeah. that are persecuting the yeah. church, I believe. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's that's part of it. Yeah, this is yeah, absolutely. And it's and, it, and it's and it's and it's it's yeah, yeah, great. That's good. Okay, let's move on here. So this is 
this is the extent of, of the works. That's kind of wild, right? That's kind of wild. He doesn't talk about all, you know, all these other outward works, right? He doesn't talk about all their endurance. He, he mentions their suffering. He, so, so here, what I'm trying to get at is there's this, there's this sense of, of empathy and compassion from Jesus. You know, he's not like, you need to be out there standing firm and taking up your cross. Do you see what I'm saying? These are people that are suffering. They're remaining faithful. And, and he's, he, he's empathetic to them. He is compassionate with them. He's not beating them up to be doing more works, to be doing more evangelism, all this different stuff. Um, he's, in, he's, he's empathizing with them. He's, he's, he's joining in with their terrible situation. Because remember, he is the one that was crucified. He is the one. So look at the connection here. If this is if this is what pastor said, which is a great statement, that this is a Jewish, Jewish, Jewish leaders, local leaders, there is a direct connection, right? Jesus is the one who was crucified by them. <laughs> he knows. He knows what they're going through. He's like, these are... These are crazy nut jobs. These are crazy nut jobs. I know what I know what's going on. Moving on here, let's look at verse number ten. So, verse number ten. What is the commands? Let's. I first identify what are the commands. I want big picture. What are the commands in verse ten? I just want the commands. Nothing else. There are several commands Do here. I want. Eat. Yes, number one. Excellent. Command number one, do not fear. And command number two, be faithful. That's the extent. Think about that. That's the extent. That's the extent. Now, let's talk first for a second. The object of be not of of do not fear is what you're about to suffer. This is the object. But my question is, my question is, someone else was told not to fear in the context, and it was in a slightly different context. Who else was told not to fear in this in the previous context? John. John. John was told not to fear. So, so John was told not to fear because it was in the context of it was in the context of of the seeing the risen exalted Lord. We have here that Jesus is the risen exalted Lord, God Himself, and the man who overcame death. And so now he's telling them not to fear death. So notice how. This huge amount of encouragement. The fear is not relationship to God, but in relationship to physical suffering. Do you see that? It's incredible. It's like the, the all-powerful vision of the Lord God himself, Jesus, is now meant to be an encouragement. All that power, the one who has the keys of death and Hades, to the Ephesus, it's like, you got to clean your act up. Here, it's like, don't worry. <laughs> I'm on your side. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't fear what you're about to suffer okay now now look at look at the there is a prophetic statement here a prophetic statement what is the prophetic statement behold the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you will be tested yeah. Uh, let me fix this here. Yeah. So there's this there's this prophetic statement that that they are going to they are going to suffer they're going to be they're going to suffer. Um, they will suffer physical persecution more.
Now, this is an interpretation. This is definitely an interpretation, but I think it's the Jews that are going to do this because the Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. And the devil is about to throw them in prison. So the connection here, I think, is clear, is that it's probably going to be coming from the Jewish authorities uh, or, or the kingdom of Satan as a whole and their suffering. You know. But notice this. Notice this. This is the sovereignty of God. This is the sovereignty of God here, okay? The sovereignty of God is that God is using this suffering as a purpose to confirm them. Does everyone see that? First Peter 1 talks about this. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Tim. Yeah. I think the reason why, you know, behold, the devil is about to throw some into prison. I think what, what the, what the Lord was saying is like, even though the persecutors are the, the religious leaders, this these humans, but really, the 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 ones behind all these persecutions against the Christians while they're suffering, is the devil himself. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's yeah, that's an excellent summary of yeah. So it's uh, Satan and. His kingdom is behind it. No, that's great. That's a great way to uh, synthesize everything. Satan and his kingdom is behind this. Excellent. And this is actually speaking then to what we talked about before. Partners of kingdom, uh, tribulation, And patient endurance. Remember that? Everyone remember that? Yes. So we see all three brought in here. They're, they're fighting against the kingdom of Satan. They're in the kingdom of God. They're fighting against the kingdom of Satan. They're experiencing tribulation. They're experiencing suffering. And there's this call to endure. So really what I want us to see here is that I think that we have, to, we have to view that statement in verse 9. We have to view that statement in verse 9 as, as uh, comprehensive throughout the rest of Revelation. That uh, church members, followers of Christ, they are, they are fundamentally a part of this tribulation kingdom and patient endurance. Sometimes it's going to be more accentuated, sometimes not so much. But this is the the description of our of us as the church in this life until Christ returns. So, so this go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to. Is that what you're referring to as as far what as what you underline there to be tested the purpose? Can you explain that a bit more? That you yeah. may be tested. Yeah. So that you may be tested. So we what we know is that. God, from the beginning of time, God tests his people not to cause them to go into temptation, but to confirm their faith. Abraham was tested. Um, the children of Israel were tested. David was tested. Um, the prophets were tested. The, those in exile, Israel, when they're in exile, was, were tested. Jesus was tested. And, and uh, first Peter. We don't. We won't go there because we're running out of time. First Peter one, I, I believe it's three through twelve. In First Peter one three through twelve, they are also tested that the, the genuineness of the of, of their faith uh, is going to be refined and and shown to be real. It's going to be tested with fire. James. James. Chapter one, 1, verse 3 to 12, talks about the testing is bringing us to completion, bringing us to maturity. Okay? So this is the purpose behind God allowing Satan to, ca to cause us to suffer. Okay? 
So in many ways, uh, Satan means it for evil. God means it for good. And, and Jesus is sovereign over the whole thing. Okay? And, and so here we have, we have just, this is a description. This is, a, 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 this is the statement number one, and this is number two. So there's this uh, a, a short period of tribulation. But we know historically Polycarp was killed. Polycarp was killed, martyred in 155 AD. So there is a, there is a long history of suffering of this church in the context of this church. Okay. Look at the promise now. This, this is now leading us into the promise. There's a promise here. The promise is that he will give. Jesus will give the church the crown of life. Now, in some circles, they view this as a special, uh, like this is, this is a special, this would be a, this would be a special martyr. Uh, a special martyr reward. And so I, will, I, I disagree with that. I disagree with that because because James refers to the crown of life as well. So, so James also refers to this. If you look at James, he also refers to this. And in that context, it's not, necess- it's not clear that it's a, it's a martyr reward, meaning to say that it's more than just martyrs that are receiving this reward. And so how I understand, how would you re- how could we restate crown of life? What I, the, the, a, be- a better translation, this is a literal translation, a a, uh, a, 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 a translation that contains the full significance would be the reward which is life. And this life is really eternal life. The eternal life promised in John's gospel. Everyone tracking there with me? So it's not a special martyr's reward. It's the reward that all of us receive. Eternal life. So there's a call to perseverance here, okay? Everyone, everyone tracking with me there? Is that, is that the same promise he makes to the people in Ephesus where he says the right to eat from the tree yeah. of life? Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. the same thing. It's, it's exactly, yeah. So, so different situation. Different place, different place in their spiritual walk, same reward. So here, they're, they're, they're not getting slapped around by Jesus. They're saying, Jesus is saying, you're suffering, you know, remain faithful. You're going to get the reward of life. The other church has all these good outward works. They're inwardly sinful, hardened, falling away. Repent, you're going to get the same reward. You see what I'm saying? So in each of these, we're going to look, once we, once, we, once we go through all of these churches, we will start to see patterns emerge. And then we'll, we'll have some big synthesis for, so like right now we're looking at the seven literal churches, but we talked about how the seven literal churches is, are, is signifying the universal church as well. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that once we see these, these parallel repeat, repetitive ideas, we can then uh, pull out application for ourselves, okay? And of course, there's application for us in each of these churches, but I hope that we can see that bigger picture of, of a unified call uh, in, in spite of different circumstances, okay? Um, let's go down here. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, this is a, this is a call. This is another command. This is another command here. A command to hear. A command to hear. Okay. And and this hearing is 
with the idea of leading to obedience. And this is going back to Revelation 1, 3. Blessed are the ones who hear the words of this prophecy. Write the words to the church in Smyrna, right? Blessed are the ones who, who, re, who, who read aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and obey. So in each of these letters, it's going back to this first blessed statement of reading aloud the words, hearing the words, and then obeying them. And of course, there is this, this is a prophetic context. The prophet, Jesus as a prophet in, in, in the Gospels will also say the same similar thing. It's, 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 it's this unique statement calling to obedience, to, to, to obedience. Um, look at this, look at this here. Now, this promise is the final promise. And it's the the, the object is will not be hurt by the second death. And the second death, what's the first death? If you can imagine, what, what's the first death? A anyone want to take a crack at it? What's the first death? It's not rocket science. Well, so some people have interpreted um, first resurrection, second resurrection, first being spiritual, second being physical. But here, the, the, the first okay. death, I, I, don't, I don't want us to read too much into this. The first death, right, would be a reference to, to physical death, right? We would die physically, right? But you're thinking along those lines, Frank. That, th those are good thoughts to have because we're thinking along spiritual and physical, okay? So, so but watch, watch this now. So this is, this is physical death. So what do you think second death refers to? Um, I think the second death would be um, after you die, you're separated from God. Yeah. And that's even worse than the first death. Yes. Um, that means you're going to hell. So the big theological word that they say here is this is eska Tological death, uh, eternal, eternal death, and ultimately, I love what Raul said. This is a separation, a separation, eternal separation. Okay, excellent. So this is the big takeaway. Think about this. Look at this. Look at this. Okay. I'll just use this to kind of be scary, okay? Be faithful unto death. You will have tribulation for 10 days. They will throw you into, be, into, into prison. You are, about to you are about to suffer. You will have tribulation, okay? So you will you're, you're in tribulation. You're, you're about to suffer. You're going to prison. You will have tribulation. Be faithful even to death. Don't worry. <laughs> You'll get out of the second death. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? It's like divine. Jesus, Jesus says in his words, don't worry, don't fear him who can who can um oh, I'm gonna mess, I'm gonna mess this up. Don't fear him who can um uh can destroy the body. But can, yes, it's quoted pastor. I'm totally messing up. Don't fear him who can destroy the body. Don't fear him who can destroy the body, but fear those who can destroy the body and the spirit. Yes, yes. It's like the whole point here is don't worry about the first death. Don't worry about the first death. Remember, I've overcome. I've overcome the death. I've overcome it. I have the keys to Hades. <laughs> the one who overcomes, the one who conquers, the one who experiences tribulation remains faithful to the kingdom and overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Okay? So, first church, if you can imagine first church, you know, he's kind of slapping him around. There, He's like, you, you guys got to get serious. You guys got to repent. This church, it's a different situation. They, they're remaining faithful, but they're experiencing persecution. So perhaps, perhaps our situation does not follow the situation of Ephesus 
What if our situation is that of this church? Now, maybe not, but if we're experiencing this suffering, there's a different word that God has for us. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's crazy. Uh, so if you're experiencing persecution, if you're experiencing suffering, don't fear. Be faithful. Number one, don't fear. Number two, be faithful even to death. Number three, listen to this promise. Listen to this promise. The one who conquers will never be hurt by the second death. 